welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to a uh, not only a webinar, a conversation, hopefully with you on a subject that is as uh, you know explosive and exciting as any subject right now in our exponential world, uh, which is the whole realm of the spatial web, Web 3.0, uh, DAOs, NFTs, and just how our lives are about to change. We're going to be transforming the economic engines of society, uh, transforming how and where we spend our time, and literally how we engage with our customers, how influencers engage with the people that they want to influence. Uh, I have with me today uh, two of my closest friends on the planet and two brilliant individuals. Let me uh, first introduce Salim Ismail, who's my going to be my uh, co-interviewer. Uh, Salim is the founder and chairman of EXO Works and OpenEXO. Um, uh, it's being, you know, implementing the lessons from his book, Exponential Organizations. Uh, and, you know, Salim is just one of the top thinkers in the area of how our companies transforming. And the spatial web, Web 3.0, is part of this transformation. Previously, he was the the uh, executive director of Singular University, and he led Brickhouse, Yahoo's internal incubator. Uh, and full disclosure, Salim and I are now writing Exponential Organizations too, uh, which is the follow-on book to uh, Salim's brilliant first book. Salim, good to see you, my friend. Welcome. Great to be here, as always. Yes. All right, let me introduce our guest, uh, who we're going to be just, you know, just double teaming and interviewing. Uh, Eric Poulier. Eric is uh, a widely published author, speaker, technologist, but first and foremost, he's an incredible entrepreneur. He's one of the only people in history to have founded six ventures that uh, grew to a value of over $100 million. Uh, he was named one of the 30 e-visionaries, um, and he is the founder and CEO of Vatim Inc., uh, you know, magnum cum laude of Harvard University, uh, you know, if that matters to anybody, but most and foremost for me, he's just a brilliant friend. Uh, Eric, thank you. Hi. Hey, thanks for having me, Peter. A, a, a pleasure. And uh, I just, I think to start this conversation, people need to know uh, your history here. Six years ago, uh, and our friendship goes back a decade now, six years ago, uh, you were the very first person I ever heard talk about an NFT, what it was, you know, how to mint NFTs. And now six years later, you know, taxi drivers and moms are talking about this. Uh, <laughs> yes. uh, if you don't mind, since I consider you the, the creator of the, of the first NFT, take us back six years. And what were you thinking back then? Yeah, sure. I'll do that. Um, I'll, I can take you back though. So 20 when uh, taxi drivers were talking about uh, dot com just before the dot com crash. So be careful about um, when when it becomes a, a quite a white hot frenzy. What's next? But then, you know, we saw what happened with the Internet. So I wouldn't worry too much about that. But it's it's years, done OK. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, I think it's done OK. Some some companies like Google came, you know, to rise after that. So there's. Um, there's an interesting uh, story here because six years ago, when all tokens were fungible, um, it was very clear even then that blockchain was going to matter, right? We, we didn't exactly know how. So by the way, just for, we have a really diverse group of viewers on YouTube and Twitter and our Abundance Digital members and so forth, whose questions will be going to uh, as well in the second half of this hour. But uh, define fungible and non-fungible for everybody one second. Oh, sure. So when you have something that's fungible, then everyone is replaceable with another, uh, such as gold. When you buy a piece of gold, you don't care which piece of gold you get. You just care that it's pure, that it has certain qualities, and that it fits the definition of, of an ounce of gold, for instance. Um, when you take something that is fungible, every single one matters, and it's different, like a piece of art or anything really that's, that's physical, that might trade, uh, it has a difference. Uh, a baseball card is fungible, you know, one is not like the other. Uh, and so you can trade them uh, as distinguished from one another. So in the world of Bitcoin, uh, that's the first fungible token. If I send you a Bitcoin, you don't say, well, wait a minute, which one are you sending me? And <laughs> when was it made? And who mined it? And I want the provenance. 
you just say, thanks, <laughs> appreciate it. <laughs> uh, Non-fungible token matters. It's one is different than the other. Nice. So going back to six years ago, what were you thinking with NFTs? What did yeah. you call them back then? So back then we called them NFTs, uh, oddly enough. But people who were smarter than us said, well, nobody's ever going to pick up on that phrase. Uh, it's really quite geeky and nutty. And you're, you know, you're just being uh, you know, in your own little bubble. So once you come up with something that is more, uh, that, that defines it better in terms of what your vision is, that a, that a normal person might actually grok. And so in thinking this through, my view of NFTs, which is really now just coming to fruition, was really not so much about celebrating its uh, ability to be speculated. In other words, its ability to buy low, sell high, to move it as an instrument of trade. That is, that is important, very important. But I, my, my um, theory from the beginning was that these things would be instruments of engagement and that they would come alive with 3D graphics and animation and that their singular character, that they're authentic and that they could trace all the characteristics of a Bitcoin would come back uh, to trick the human brain in a way to think that they are just as real as something made out of atoms, something physical. So to answer your question, the name that we um, went to and that I coined at the time was a atom, a virtual atom, because I wanted to evoke an emotion in people that we could dissolve the boundaries between bits and atoms in our brains. And if you could actually create something made out of bits, out of imagination, that had value that could then also be magic because obviously it's code and didn't have the same constraints as something made physically, you would unleash an enormous multi-trillion dollar economy and, and become a new canvas for human imagination. So we called it the Vatom. Yep, and, uh, and the company right now, uh, Vatom Inc. is a derivative of that. Yes. Um, so uh, Salim, do you wanna jump in or should we talk about how, I mean, one of the things I'm super excited about is the uh, use of Vadim's NFTs in customer engagement for companies and for influencers, because it's gonna transform uh, all of that. But before I jump there, Salim, do you wanna add anything? No, no I think this is, uh, the definitional aspects are really powerful right now, early on, because then you laid a foundation for much richer discussion. Um, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by both the engagement side, but also as we go to the decentral the decentralized world. How do you? How do people migrate through those different paradigms? And I'd, I'd love to get your thoughts on those. But and we'll, we'll talk about back to we'll you, Peter. Both of those. But I think one one point just to make for everybody listening here: the vision that Eric has, and that I'm super excited about, is you know we're going to be spending more and more time in the virtual world. Uh, we're going to be spending it in a number of metaverses. And I'm going to go into a metaverse and see something that I want digitally and grab it and the ability to take it from any metaverse to any metaverse to any metaverse and into the real world as well is i think the vision eric that you've yeah. been building can you double click yeah. on that yeah i really would i'd like to also clear up uh, i think a misconception that is brought about by uh, those who capture the attention of the public with a definite their definition of metaverse and maybe I think uh, pervert it from what it really is in my, in my uh, parlance. So the way I see it is that we're building a persistent meta plane on top of physical reality, right? And so it's not that you necessarily do something in IRL or in real life, as it's called, uh, or you do something in the metaverse. It's that the metaverse is an extension of real life and becomes part of real life, right? This is why I don't really like the phrase is augmented reality or virtual reality so much, although they're descriptive enough that you can use them for people to know what you mean. I prefer the notion of extended reality. We are extending where we live, how we live, work and play into what you might experience through AR and VR. And so the definition of metaverse to me is a place that you can actually interact with one another socially and with the things that in that space. So the web was the first metaverse in my mind. It, it, it was an open system. It was absolutely astounding. Anybody on the planet 
uh, could make a website and then anyone with any device that could that could have it could host a browser could access it. So people homesteaded and they put up their life and they put up interesting things and they, they, they sold things and they made a living and everyone could access it. But it was flawed in some ways. But those ways gradually get chipped away at. The first websites were static. You know, you, you could barely do anything. Then people came along and said, well, what if we made them dynamic and they can change what's on the page based on databases and real world events and, and, and interactions with the user? Then people started to say, what about commerce and semantic integration and AI, et cetera? And it started to grow. The next generation of the web, I believe, is the metaverse. I mean, that's what I think it is. But it adds three critical ingredients that don't exist today. People, places, and things. Those three things, if you really think about them, are not part of the web today, but they change everything in terms of what it means to engage and to be present and to connect as humans. People is your identity. The notion of self-sovereign identity, you know, need look only uh, as far as Tim Berners-Lee. What's he obsessed with these days? The guy who, you know, probably is why we're all sitting here talking about this. Identity, <laughs> but yeah. not identity of like, how do we, you know, enrich Facebook with our data? Like, we already know how to do that. <laughs> it's <laughs> identity that we own ourselves, self-sovereign identity that we control and that we can divvy out according to who we want to have access and not have access at any given time. And we can move across, quote unquote, websites or metaverses, spatial metaverses with our own identity. The next thing is, well, if you are someone, you can own things. So true ownership. Uh, ownership is very, very important. I think we're going to move from a sharing economy, which was quite impactful, to an ownership economy, and I'll explain why that is. But ownership changes the psychology of things, and it really changes how you engage and, and how you think about stuff. So now you, you have yourself, you have the stuff you own, and now the most important piece is how do you interact with others in communities? And Salim will have a lot to say about this, because I think he's one of the real pioneers in how communities are going to govern and self-govern and be built in this new space. But you have to now enable people with their things to now interact with one another in this new meta plane uh, in AR and in VR. And that's what we call the spatial web. And Eric, would you uh, take it the next step? And how do you see companies and influencers engaging with their customers using yeah. VATOMs, using yeah. NFTs and Again, I just think we're, we've touched a fraction of 1% of what NFTs could represent. Absolutely. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a little bit of a frivolous per, uh, element of it compared to the substance it's going to have in value. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. We are, we're not at inning one of this amazing game that we're so privileged to play here, uh, but we are playing it very fast. I've never seen such innovation as I've seen in, in Web3. Uh, really even more than in the days when the web was first uh, becoming popular. What we're seeing now is spectacular innovation, at first driven by the same thing that drove the web, was get-rich-quick schemes. So oh, I can you know, get something out there, buy, sell, sell high. You're going to find a lot of that fall out. And there's just no doubt about it. No one knows when. Um, but we're not so concerned about that because we see the substance of what's behind it is a movement. It's a new era that we're stepping into. And so when you think about NFTs today, uh, you think about speculation. So to answer your question, where we go next is we move to engagement and story and narrative. A wise man named um, Gordon Bowen said that objects plus story equal treasure. That's what makes something valuable. And if you add, I love that. I it's love it's that. Very, very, very important to think about that because we are inherently... Um, biological beings that evolved to, uh, to tell stories and to connect around that. There's studies uh, that show our longevity is linked to our connectivity to one another and our social network. So we are really linked to want to be uh, connected and to, to tell stories and to drive each other forward with narratives. And these objects have to do that. And if you, if you ask like, well, what are the most uh, you know, valuable things? They're gonna be the ones with the best stories, not the best art. <laughs> you know, Bob Dylan wasn't the best singer. He was a very good storyteller with his, with his art. And so what we have here is this shift. Now, I want to be very clear because we talk a lot about NFTs. Let's not forget about FTs as well in this same thing, when, you know, fungible tokens, because we are, when we talk about decentralized finance and Web3 technologies, we're talking about a very uh, organic interchange between fungible tokens and non-fungible tokens. And I'll explain how this this interplays to create what's going to be, I believe, the new economy. So 
Uh, if you think about um, today, how a creator or a brand or an advertiser or a company reaches out to its constituents, to, to, to the public, uh, there, there's a number of choices. They can, they can do a, a, a blast and pray out to <laughs> certain types of media. They can put a, do a magazine ad, they can do a billboard, they can go to Zuckerberg and say, hey, can you get me some customers? And they'll say, sure, but I'm not gonna tell you who they are. <laughs> um, you know, you can pay me more to get more access. Um, you can go to Google, but you know, uh, online, a lot of that money has kind of aggregated around Google and Facebook, but there's other players as well. Um, but what's happened in recent times is a phenomenon that was just hit a punctuation mark. And I think it's an exclamation mark in recent weeks. So over time, the consumer got tired of that. They've been besieged by messages, email blasts, and different ways to tweet and to use your data in kind of surreptitious, not necessarily ethical ways to, to reach you with things you may or may not want. And in that, in that um, quote unquote, advertising uh, fray, you started to see a level off of patience among the consumer community. Now you couple that with laws that started to hit around privacy and what you're allowed to do, and then couple that with the new cookie uh, policy that Apple put in place, which completely turned around the whole industry of, of what you're allowed to, what you can you know, technically actually track. Um, the, the, the world is, is seeking, every advertiser, every brand, every company that wants to reach consumers are seeking the same thing. How do I reach a consumer and get first party data and build a long term value based relationship that doesn't annoy them, that's built on value? And so, what we see with the emergence of um, NFTs and, uh, and, and tokens, you're going to see two things. One is NFTs as an instrument of engagement where they're network aware. And when you give somebody something and they say thank you and they're happy with it, you now have a relationship with them. They've opted in for more goodness. And gamification principles where they might actually have fun because you're giving, there's, there's a number of types of value that you can bring someone. Why don't you give them something that's resellable or that you can cash in for something? Uh, the other one is that you can, it, it can be fun. <laughs> you know, you can give them something to play with and it will draw them forward through a, 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 a life cycle. Could you, give a, could you give a concrete example of this? I mean, uh, sure. Vadim is already powering this stuff. You've built, this is not theoretical You've built the Vatim wallet, you've built yeah. the system and yeah. so forth. I don't know if you can talk about what we discussed sure. at the board meeting yesterday. Uh, full disclosure, I'm on Eric's board here because I'm so excited about it, but, um, or a theoretical example, if you can't talk about. Yeah, no, I can talk about real world examples. I mean, right now at the, in, the, in the community of this stuff happening, almost all of the activity that you're reading in breathless waves of how much people spent on a board mm -hmm. ape or on a, uh, on a, you know, crypto punk is, is when a very small group, you know, probably 2% of the population or less, 98% uh, is still not really knowledgeable on this and not really wanting to spend the time, but where we've really excelled and where our vision is what we're trying to do is we're trying to bring the other 98%. We're trying to move the, the, the world towards this model because it's more effective, more efficient, and better for, for all parties, I think, especially as we start to get into the what we'll talk about later in the creator economy. But just to answer your question, just, just for instance, um, yesterday is a good example. Um, one of the more established companies in the world, trustworthy and known for conservatism and, and someone you can rely on is State Farm Insurance. Um, State Farm Insurance has engaged with NFTs and an NFT wallet in order to engage with its customers nationwide in a spectacular success uh, with, in, in conjunction with uh, several quarterbacks and, and several um, influencers. They, they dropped um, digital footballs all over the country. And people picked them up. In fact, yesterday, um, almost 500,000 of these footballs were picked up by tens of thousands of people. And, and, and they got rewarded in a gamification process where valuable NFTs fell into their wallets. These are not people who we said, okay, you wanna play this game? First, go to this class, get a PhD or spend X number of times you know, figuring out how to do it and then come back and you can do this. We just said, click here, right? Click here, play, fun, go. And the result is people have these valuable things. And if you look at OpenSea, a lot of them figured out. How many, how many of these digital footballs were picked up yesterday? Um, well, now it's well over 600,000 between yesterday and today. 
Uh, so I think uh, it's the largest, you know, the largest digital uh, ev- grab yeah. event in in history. Oh, I mean. for sure. And 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 it, you know, kudos to the people who who see what was going to become commonplace in the future. But certainly, is the most powerful way to reach people now <laughs> in a way that makes them feel good about the interaction. Thank you. you know, for the time what I love about what you've done is you created on the Vatim uh, platform the ability to use right now your phone and look around and see is there a digital uh object in your field of view this is you know sort of pokemon go style but uh and being able to collect those but as soon as the customer or the company starts dropping these uh these digital uh uh fts and nfts um then that customer has a relationship with the individual who picked it up it's so important. I mean, you, 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 there's no more important point than that. In order to have something, you have to be someone. And if you are someone in, in a system and you've given permission based on value, not because we've somehow surreptitiously found out something about you and done something that you know, has dubious ethics, but with true ethical uh, and legal and, 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 and proper you know, care, done something that's fun and mutually beneficial. And someone says like, wow, thanks. That's cool. What else you got for me? Yeah, I'd like to play the next thing. Yeah, I'll watch this video and I'll learn the next thing and I'll, and I'll proceed down the path. You'll see in the wallet, the other things that fell in were not only NFTs, but videos with kind of fun, quirky messages from State Farm. And they were able to watch you know, a certain amount of them and other things would fall into their wallet. You know, so it, it, it goes on. But here's the most important thing, Peter. Um, Traditionally, campaigns like this, where brands are reaching to consumers, have a beginning, middle, and an end. Where we're moving is that there's no end. Shame on you if you've developed a relationship with a consumer where they're happy with you and they enjoy that relationship, and then you can't follow up to continue it, right? That's what every brand wants, is long-term relationships that can be built upon over time. That's the essence of commerce and the essence of good business and good customer relationships. So the next generation of NFTs will look more like CRM than like, you know, Vegas, uh, you know, yes, it's great that you that this value you can do something with. You can pass it down through generations. You can give it to your friends. You can even put it on OpenSea. If you look yesterday on OpenSea, is one of the top ten uh, NFTs on there. <laughs> We're coming from this game, um, you know. And what's so interesting about this, if you really take it out into the future, the first, the next step is everybody starts to shift. What does it mean to to market and to advertise into an ownership based economy mindset? The next thing that happens is how do you shift your loyalty programs around this? Because what is loyalty other than maintaining a relationship and having people want to return to your brand and engage more? Now, on the loyalty side, you're going to have more of what you might call fungible tokens or what we call social tokens. Right now, you haven't heard probably a lot about social tokens as a phenomenon. NFTs is probably the word that most people have heard around the dinner table. Well, watch out. (laughs) Dinner table is changing because social tokens are coming right behind it. What's that? That's a, that's kind of, you can think of it as a loyalty point on steroids. The difference between a normal loyalty point and a social token is the notion of a decentralized unit that can be moved within the system, um, but has various properties. Some of the properties act as loyalty where it's not that you necessarily spend them. You can spend them maybe for discounts and things, but you hold them and get various benefits in the metaverse. For instance, VIP backroom access, access to rehearsals of, a, of an artist. Um, uh, by, by giving somebody these tokens and allowing them to benefit by holding them, you're strengthening the community. But now the next thing happens, which is even more astounding. You move from giving these people the tokens and hoping that they'll want to stay to giving them ways to earn the tokens, right? Participatory, act, participatory engagement, 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 engagement in the community to yeah, build yeah. the community, not just to say, oh, wow, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll buy a yogurt and get it at 11th. No, I'm going to spend my time building this community because I believe in it. Yeah. And we're going to be uh, in, we're going to be playing with this at Abundance 360 this year uh, using the, the, Vatim, uh, the Vatim platform. Uh, Salim, what are you what are you thinking? What question do you have here? Well, I think the you're Eric's hitting a bunch of these topics, which is this is the engagement on steroids, right? We talk in the book about community 
And we now have a way of engaging community in a very, very meaningful way. Uh, I'm, I was looking up the Board Ape Yacht Club, which is the the biggest NFT project. It's like a ten billion dollar ecosystem out of nothing. Yeah. yeah. Um, because they they've figured out how to take the digital NFT and give you real world access. Like you can only get into certain physical events if you have if you're a board ape, and so therefore you you've you've created a, a bridge from the virtual world to the real world, which is where the things become really exciting, like these these footballs, etc. Uh, am I able to share my screen for a second? I wanted to get Eric's viewpoint on something. Is that possible yeah. from a technical uh, perspective? I I have no idea, but uh, I'm going to I'm going to try and does. do it, and let's see if this works. Okay, uh, Eric, this is Decentraland, and can you guys see my screen? It's coming on. Yes, we see it. Okay, yep. so this is Decentraland, uh, and this is a a, a a website called Pixel Mind, mm -hmm. where they're taking uh, using GPT three and AI to create virtual images. Right. Yep. So you yep. put in a couple of keywords, and it literally does gener generative art. Yes. Uh, using these pixelated images. And I can imagine a world where we start stepping through uh, this stuff. I'm going to just try and move this around a little bit, see if I can do this, where I can kind of start stepping through this in a really powerful way and engaging at a very personal level with this. So I'd love to get your, th your thoughts on this type of a construct as yes. we go forward. Do you see brands doing this? Do you see people... Um Yes. Buy space in this. Where do you see this? Oh going? yes, of course. And I might even um, do you one better and share my screen in a moment as well to show a next gen of that. So a couple of things in what you just showed. First is it's a it's a it's a metaverse. Uh, it's a, and it touches on the notion of generative art as as NFTs. Uh, so first of all, yes. I mean, generative art is absolutely on fire, and it makes a lot of sense to me of why it would be. Um, instead of um, the artist, uh, the, you might have a human artist as, as a seed for something that then changes, but not always. Uh, it might just be an algorithm. Uh, it might be an algorithm with a suicide switch, which says this specific algorithm, I'm going to create all this stuff and then I'm gone. <laughs> and that's <laughs> it. That's all I'm going to do. And now, you know, that becomes even more valuable. The, the, this market is just beginning, but it's, it's absolutely going to be incredible. And what's so interesting about it is... It has genuine value in people's minds because the, the scarcity and the interesting things about it might also never happen again in that same way. And the community around them start to become very, very powerful. Now, from, to answer your question, are brands going to get involved? Of course. Why wouldn't if you? Can, if you can help create something that has zero marginal cost of goods of production and you, oh. can, and you can distribute it versus a T-shirt, which costs a lot of money, not only to make and to sell and, you know, and, and to distribute, of course, you're going to come up with ways if the audience is thrilled with it. And in this case, you don't find a lot of audiences uh, reselling their, their commemorative t-shirts, but you will find people cherishing these, not only reselling them, but using them as instruments of status. You know, yeah. you know, we're moving into a world where avatars are going to be more and more uh, showcases of, of how you kind of uh, pump yourself up among, among your peers. So showcasing you got one of these things is key. The other thing that I'll mention on, on, on what you said, Salim, which I think is really important for everyone to understand, is the guys at Board Ape, Board Apes, are, they're, they're nobody's fools. I mean, they, they are very smart and very good. Um, so it's not very easy to do what they've done, but it's, it is easy to, 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 to review it and look at it as a kind of a blueprint for you know, some of the best practices, I think. One of the more interesting things they've done is you can actually own the copyright. Like almost everything you do, like if you go to Disney and, and you get the rights to, you know, you buy a t-shirt, you don't own Mickey Mouse, <laughs> you know, they'll sue the hell out of you if you, you know, try to do something with it to make money. But if you get a board Ape, you might go into business making a board Ape musical. You might go into make a board Ape, you know, lunch boxes. Like there are things you can now do as an owner that, that, that are really about real ownership. Like that's a dramatic departure from the past. Hmm. The other dramatic departure from the past is if you're a brand and you're, and you're a creator and you're outreaching to, to your community and you give them something, there's a very, very important difference in what you've just done. You've given them something that they own, right? So you can't, let, let's use a real world example back into the, the, the atom uh, sphere, the, the, the physical place. If I opened a store and you walked in and I, and I sold you a lamp and I said, great, Salim, Thank you for this uh, 500 bucks for this lamp. Uh, it's, a, it's a great antique. 
Uh, only one thing I got to tell you now that you've given me your money, uh, you can't take the lamp out of the store. Uh, and by the way, um, if the store ever closes, then the, the lamp's going to die and you don't get your money back. And guess what? Uh, we are actually closing this store. It was a pop up. <laughs> so goodbye. You're going to sue them. So what happens is this mindset of saying we're going to have our own app, our own data, our own world that 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 lives within our own campaigns to reach consumers ships because now you've given somebody something that you have to allow them to take out. Yeah. Right. So now you're going to increasingly see this work happen within the wallet within people's wallets, as opposed to within yet another 74th app when you already have, uh, you know, you only use four, <laughs> you know, so you're, we're, we're finding a, a shift there too. So many, so many changes happen with these subtle things. Hmm. So for me, the, the most powerful thing, it's like cryptocurrencies, right? For me, the most powerful thing is not that you have a digital currency, the fact you can program it. That's right. Um, and that becomes interesting. With NFTs, is the same thing. I find it's not the fact that it's a unique token. Right. The fact that I can create an architecture, give it certain characteristics, rarity, and so all these that, other things. So, Eric, that's something that's that, you're, that you're driving. Can you talk about, I mean, yeah. NFTs coming alive and, and transforming and, and having different superpowers. That's right. I mean, you've been talking about that for, for the six better years. part of six years. <laughs> Yeah, that's exactly right. Look, when, when we made the first NFTs, uh, it's kind of like calculus and other things that kind of get the idea as time has come. I hate to like go out and, 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 and kind of raise a frag and say, we invented the first NFT, et cetera. But, you know, we were, it was a time that it was so obvious that, that it was now try, time to do this. And there were some very, uh, I guess, around the same time as us, there were some early projects like Colored Coin or um, Omni layer that, that Craig Sellers made who, who then uh, joined us. And of course, so standing on the shoulders of giants of people like Philip Rosedale in Second Life and Brock Pierce who pioneered trading goods in secondary markets and games. But then we worked into the blockchain world and we started to see that this was important. But the most important thing to me right from the start, having lived through the web years, was not that you could get a URL and put up a website, it's what does it do? Right. Yes, I could go and I could homestead, uh, you know, Coca-Cola.com and, and, and hold them ransom because I knew they were coming. There's a lot of ways to make money. But what's the most interesting, most impactful thing you can do that's going to stand the test of time is story narrative utility. And the programmability of these NFTs is what we've pioneered to give an example. Things. Yeah. So here's a simple example. The simplest was back years ago already, which Intel took uh, programmable NFTs. And, and uh, under the guidance of a brilliant woman at Intel named Stacy Shulman, who was a chief innovation officer at the time, uh, they released hundreds of, uh, of digital butterflies, NFTs, into New York City that were, we call them distributed autonomous life forms because they're not only programmable, but they're independently alive. They, their programming works on long running processes outside of what you set them out with. So you may be the creator, but they don't care about you anymore. It's like your kids, you know, hopefully your kids still care about you, but you know, at some point they go and do their own thing. But you know, similar to these butterflies, they go out in the world. Now they exist in, again, what we talk about is an extension of our physical plane of reality. They can only be in one place at one time. If I pick it up, they're gone for everybody. Um, but they can also hold other things and they're network aware. So these butterflies, every time you grabbed one, would give, uh, Intel would give money to charity but also they're holding gifts. So if you grabbed one and you looked inside, it might be a Starbucks coffee. You take out that NFT, bring it to Starbucks, get a real coffee. They're also network aware. So if one was perhaps a Jets fan and the Jets score a touchdown, they can flap their wings and drop gifts wherever they are and cheer, and, and, and cheer for the Jets. So they're, they're alive, they change space. So it really is a massive opportunity to change the way we think about uh, engagement because there, there really are- With no an economic- with an economic layer on top of it, which is going to That's reinvent right. everything. And, and Eric, is Vadim creating the the eco the platform to build these metaverses, uh, or do right. you have one metaverse? It sounds like you're building the ecosystem where anybody can come and build these things. Yes, that's exactly right. What we're building is what we think of is as the gateway to the multiverse, right? We're for the other 98% of the people who want to click on something, get in, and, and not have to learn the intricacies and the complexities of, of the underlying Web3 machinery. Uh, we want you to make it, we want to make it as easy as going to a website, which, which yeah. everybody can do. Now, as we, as we advanced our uh, trajectory over time, 
we built a um, collaborated with uh, you know our team and built an open source project called Block V, which still runs in Switzerland, powered by the token V V E E, and that has a really powerful set of technologies involved that allow you to do programmable digital objects. And it's open source, and various folks can use it. We've incorporated it into our stack as well. And when we make a Vatom, we 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 consume that that token V E E. Now, if you if you look at the enormous uh, um, swelling of the largest brands in the world that are starting to recognize that NFTs matter. The first thing you're going to realize is that they step back and say, wait a minute, why are we doing this? We're not in the get rich quick scheme thing. It doesn't matter to our balance sheet if we put out something for 10,000 and made a million dollars. We need to get, you know, millions of customers to love us more and to engage with us and to, you know, want to learn more about us. So mm -hmm. that's where this is shifting. So our model, just to answer your question is, we enable the mass audience first to enter the, the, the metaverse, which is you know, through the wallet to become uh, to, to, to engage in AR and VR, which we call spatial web, right? That's the massively uh, scalable social platform. But you have to think of us as a wallet of wallets because we want to be able, you want to be able to bring your NFTs from wherever they're made, whether they're from Vatom and the Black V platform or from other places. And we want you to be able to go into AR and interact with anything that's there, make galleries, you know, personal galleries with your stuff, and then interoperate with everything from Roblox to Minecraft to Fortnite to, to, to Decentraland and Sandbox and Somnium Space and all these wonderful projects, each of which has an audience and a niche that is capable uh, and interested. Like you won't find a lot of 65 year olds saying, my gosh, I can't wait to get back to my Roblox game. But you will find an enormously powerful audience in a certain demographic. Same thing with Decentraland, right? There's a certain group that wants to get on MetaMask and you know learn the, the ropes and, and wants to interact with that world. And that'll get bigger and bigger, but it's still a niche. What we think is gonna happen is that the multiverse is gonna be made up of an underlying uh, interoperability where your, your identity and your stuff will stick with you. And then as you, as you get the easiest onboarding possible, which we're hoping will be us, that's what we focus on 24 seven. Once you get in there, you can go on adventures and go surprise and delight and engage with any brand you want and bring things in and out of your wallet in the real world and back. You'll go into these various elements and then a large portion of you will become creators yourselves. We don't see any difference between a brand like Procter & Gamble that we would work with or do work with or a State Farm or, or, or an iHeart and an average uh, person who gets exposed by them to this and says, oh my gosh, I can make this stuff. I can actually host my own community and bring my community into this and bring my own social token and make my own NFTs and my own galleries and monetize that with, and, and also benefit the community members and have them monetize it as we grow. Everyone's going to realize that this flywheel is just starting, but it's going to it's going to encapsulate the entire world and become the new web. I, I, I love it. It's about giving value um, to your community, right? I love the idea you said once. Uh, imagine a TV commercial where people, you know, where Coca Cola during the Super Bowl is giving out, you know, a hundred thousand cokes, and each one has a unique blockchain identifier, and yep. you either grabbed it off the TV or you didn't. Yep. Um, I love those those ideas. Yeah, and then Peter, don't forget that what goes even farther than that is in, in, in the old way of doing this technology, you might grab something like that and you say, oh, great, I got a coupon and a coupon and I can get a Coke. Now, yes, you can do that too, but you can also easily give it to someone else. You can easily um, look at its uniqueness and rarity and sell it maybe in an international market, you know, the same way people sell um, Coke bottle caps, right? And they do collect them and they do sell them. But more importantly, you're like, well, wait a minute. Hmm. If I sold this right now, I see on the marketplaces that I could probably get about fifteen dollars to two hundred dollars, right? But what if what if there's there's rumor on Reddit that says if I plant this in my in my magic flower pot that I got in Decentraland or or in somewhere in Spatial Web, and I water it with a special watering pot that was given to me by Ace Hardware, you know, through their campaign and through the, through this combination, it's going to grow and I'm going to nurture it for weeks. And now I have a throughput of 20 Cokes per week. Why would I sell it for yeah, one? A Coca-Cola plant sprouts up and gives you 20 Cokes per Yes, per week. I mean, yeah. the, the world is a game and you don't have well, to do a lot of mushrooms to realize that. 
that. It's just a, a fun place to be. <laughs> so let me posit something and then, and then tell me how you'd react to this. We have this concept of the massive transformative purpose, right? And we see brands moving their brand promise towards an MTP. But it occurs to me as, we, as this becomes richer and richer, this overall ecosystem, that the most purposely dr- purpose-driven or- organizations and projects will be the most successful because if you can take that plant and water it and then it gets to a certain threshold, then somebody goes and really actually plants a tree. Uh, okay. Now this is getting really, really um, meaningful in terms of moving the needle globally for, say, climate change or something like that. That's exactly right. Right. Um, you, you have um, brilliant entrepreneurs like Reem Corey who are building systems that allow us to measure the actual impact uh, behind the rhetoric of companies that say they're doing good. You know, a lot yeah. of this greenwashing of companies saying that they're lowering carbon footprint or they're actually doing this and that. Who knows what's really happening, yeah. right? But if you can measure this, and by the way, these things are measurable. The impact that you have, the amount of money you've matched. Procter & Gamble is one of the best companies like this. They actually put their money where their mouth is and they match things and they put money. They actually care to show impact. And they want right. to- I'm going to move us along onto DAOs. So, uh, yeah. and I'm watching the clock over here and I want to leave some time for questions as well. So uh, what is a DAO, Eric? A DAO is a distributed autonomous organization that uh, kind of- takes what we just spoke about to the next level. And I believe we'll take our society to the next level. I'm a huge believer in DAOs. I mean, it's so fascinating. So what, what it really is, is the essence of DAOs um, start with the notion of a fungible token. Like a, a, a DAO, DAO participants uh, tend to have what are, uh, or DAO tends to have what is called a multi-sig wallet, something where in order to release funds, you need more than one vote. Uh, and what happens is if you move from a sharing economy, as mentioned earlier, to a ownership economy, you're really trying to say, well, what happens now if the community that we're looking to build is not only built, operated and funded by the users, but is owned by them as well? Like they have a real feeling that this is their community, right? How do, you, how do you instill that sense of passion and purpose into something? And then that could be as something as, as, as non-social as you know, a, a, a book reading club, but could also apply to real world impact, as, as Salim said, to, to really uh, coming together to, to make a difference and showcase it. So look, uh, people want to connect, things want to connect, everything wants to connect, and people um, generally will will form communities. It's a fundamental human uh, instinct. Uh, in general, these communities tend to be centralized, run, if not by despots, at least by, you know, central rulers without much say from the people who are kind of relegated to be either manufacturing something or consuming something. They're not really participating. If they do participate, it's really in order to be a consumer or to add, you know, or to be, or, or to add something that you pay for. But, but this new model where the community itself thrives and is built by the owners of that, that's what a DAO is. And it's fueled by a token it's fueled by governance models that are only just now being uh, really explored in earnest. What we're going to see in the next six months, I guarantee this is one of the few predictions that I won't be shy about and say like, you know, uh, maybe it's 99%. In the next six months, we're going to see more innovation and amazing things happen in the Dow world than we've seen uh, in the last decade in any other sector. So if you're going to start a company now that has a, that's building a DAO, what would you do? Uh, first, I'd, I'd hire Salim to tell me what the heck to do. Um, you know, you do need expertise. You need people that, that you, the last thing you want to do is do a cursory job uh, and fall into the same trap. So it's so early that um, you want to make sure that you look at the mistakes that have been made so you can start building on that body of knowledge. So the first thing I would do is make sure that I have something I personally believe in that I want, uh, that I want to organize around uh, and, and maybe have a way uh, to, to, um, to drive. I mean, a good example, I think, is a play-to-earn game. Uh, mm-hmm. Play-to-earn games are really uh, extremely powerful phenomenon that also are going to grow exponentially in the coming years. 
uh, what they are is like there, there's in-game uh, currencies all the time for in games for for many many years. But the difference here is these currencies leave the game and, and become interoperable on decentralized exchanges back eventually into you know, no, forms of pr- crypto that everyone knows, like Bitcoin and ETH, but also into fiat, you know, by proxy through those. So um, when you have a, a DAO that is governing a game, the players are actually determining the direction of the game and what features they want to have added and how to direct the money to the developers. It's actually extraordinary. And that feeling of that, this is my game. I'm not just playing and I'll go try another one. This I'm making this game. You instill such loyalty and passion that it fuels the, an economy that you can look, you only have to look as far as, as, um, as Axie Infinity to see a phenomenon that I think is unprecedented in human history, uh, but it's just the beginning. Give me and the it, numbers on Axie Infinity, pal. Started when, how big is it now? In terms oh of- I haven't checked in 15 minutes, so I'm, I'm sure I'm wrong. <laughs> It's that you've never seen. I mean, there's exponential curves and then there's curves that are like hyper exponential. Uh, yes. Yeah. I, I mean, guess like vertical. <laughs> multiple billions of dollars of, of oh economy. My God. I mean, I, I'll bring it up as we're talking here uh, just to give you a sense of it. But um, I think the point is that um, this is this is a, the phenomenon that's here to stay. And it's going to infiltrate every not only every aspect of the gaming world, but every aspect of the world. What I believe and this is why I'm so excited about what we're doing. In fact, I will, I will go so far as to say it's the Trojan horse of what we're doing, is that as you, as you start to introduce um, the notion of a creator economy and the ability to be build gamified, uh, fun, interesting objects that have story, and you're able to uh, introduce a friction-free payment mechanism uh, to, to pay for that and put it into a system like a DAO, uh, that is that doesn't have intermediaries governing you know how how it grows you're going to move from uh, play to earn to create to earn create to earn is going to empower every living person on the planet to make a living by by singing a song by telling their story by spoken word by telling a poem by writing something by doing a piece of work that needs to be done from somebody somewhere you know the ability to have a wallet to get paid in a currency that's somewhat stable in relation to maybe your local currency as a micro in a micro economy and to actually express yourself is is phenomenal it's very very difficult you can look at 80 year olds playing axie infinity who if they put the same energy into something might get a currency they might not even have a bank account most of them don't they might not even and if they did have a bank account they might have a currency that is inflation is so run away that they would be worth a lot less after they you know, put it in their bank. And here they are playing a game that offers value and fun and play to people all over the world and it's helping earn their living. So by the way, Axie Infinity was started three years ago and it's at 7.8 billion in valuation. Yeah, they did a billion dollars in the last 24 hours. Uh, yeah, look, uh, it, it's, it's absolutely unbelievable. The fully so, diluted market cap is, is over $40 billion of this game. But what's most important is the daily volume yeah. Uh, is 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 insane. So yeah. let me uh, throw out a, a, a thing, a quick thing. Uh, Peter talks about his six Ds, right? And the technology becomes exponential when you go from deceptive to disruptive. And usability is a key to that. And we've struggled with the usability of blockchains type technologies for a while. Is, would you agree that NFTs and easy to use wallets like the ones that you're building break through that barrier? And now we make the blockchain actually fully usable. I would agree with that. I mean, Peter Diamantis is famous for putting forward a notion that he called the interface moment. An interface moment occurs when a technology that is at first relegated to enthusiasts and insiders and scientists or people that built it suddenly finds a a, a step change where an average person can use it and people who want to reach that person can make money by building something on it. A great example is the iPhone with the i with the App Store. I mean, there was plenty of things like the like yeah, the, the, the classic is Mark Andreessen creating mosaic yeah, on top of the you know on top of the ARPANET and creating the internet for us. And so I, I always think about this, Eric, that you are creating the interface moments for mm-hmm. truly utilizing the uh, uh, the spatial web, Web 3.0. Yes. Listen, I want to go to I want to go to questions if we can. We have a 
I think the official term is a shit ton of questions. <laughs> uh, and then let me ask you a question. Are you guys able to go a little bit later than the hour? I can. You can. Fantastic. I have to go and pick up my kids. So I'm going to be dropping off, but <laughs> you guys can continue. <laughs> sorry. I got like, you know, it's like, can't leave them well, hanging we'll around. Sorry you for that. And then one I have of them a has personal a interest game. in you getting those kids <laughs> on time. I, I just like, they're they're older, my boys up. are, my <laughs> boys are my priority. Yeah, uh, exactly. So, uh, first of all, before before we transition, for everyone on the Abundance Digital community who are here, uh, I want you to know that uh, this coming week, there is a Singularity University executive program going on, uh, starting on Sunday and going through the end of the week. And uh, everybody in the Abundance Digital community is getting free live stream access to that. So you can reach out to Nia and, and check in the app to make sure you have it. It's just, it's an extraordinary program. I'll be there opening up the program on Sunday night. So Sunday through Friday, uh, it's uh, SU's uh, first in-person executive program since, since the pandemic shut us down. All right, uh, Nia and uh, Tyler, let's, let's get into some Q&A from the community. Great. Um, so I'm going to combine a few questions just to make this go faster. Um, what is the best version of future applications for DAOs, metaverse, and spatial web in the next 10 to 20 years? What applications are you personally looking forward to experiencing? And who are the best examples and role models? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> An easy one to start off with. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, okay. So that, 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 those are many questions at once. So let's see if we can break it down a little bit. Uh, if you look ahead uh, in terms of what I'm excited about with this coming, I really do. I've been an enthusiast in the enormous power of the web. I really remember distinctly running around the world telling people I really believe that the web could change their businesses, their lives, their communities, uh, and why. And eventually, as it started to become prevalent, uh, making it better became a mission for millions of people around the world. And here we are again, galvanized around a concept to make it better. Well, what, what's better about this? I mean, certainly it doesn't look better to me to, when you look at the meta videos to say like, I wanna go hang out and, you know, and, and maybe play ping pong with an avatar with, with Mark Zuckerberg, it's, it's kind of like, it, it, it almost feels a little too centralized to me. And maybe, okay, that's one place I can be. What feels better to me is this notion of a multiverse with, with self-sovereign identity, where I own my own data. I, I mean, return the power back to me, back to the individual, to own your own self, and then to own your own stuff. And then within that context, to be empowered to create and express myself and without intermediaries get paid, that fundamentally not only changes how I might spend my time, it changes society. And we can lift billions of people out of poverty this way. I don't think I'm overstating or being Pollyanna-ish or, 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 or waving hands. I mean, it's simple math. If you can cut out the intermediaries and move stable coins or something that is at least somewhat more stable than how they do it today at marginal cost and have people express themselves with something of value, create an NFT, uh, package it up, put it out into the world, into the metaverse uh, as we, as we describe it, and then have that truly have the psychology of ownership, it will change everything. So, the, so to answer your question, what's most exciting to me is the fruition of that empowerment for humanity that I do really think will change the, the, the change what it means to, to be human in some way. Certainly what it'll change what it means uh, uh, to, to, to work and to create and to play. So that's what I think. In terms of the examples that I like the most out here, there's so many little projects that are, that are phenomenal and pioneers that are doing incredible work. Uh, not only in the Web3 space, but the people that we have to look back to. I mean, this is going to be controversial, what I'm about to say, um, but it's true. <laughs> if you look at all the metaverse communities in the world right now, uh, the only one that's truly vibrant and actually works is one that isn't even a Web3 community at all. It was the one that Philip Rosedale made back in the Stone Age called I Second Life. Yeah. I mean, amazingly, he hit it and figured out so many amazing things of how communities work and want to participate and help each other and build 
you know, things together. So, you know, you, you, it's retro hip to look at that, but people tend to forget, like we're not, we, we can move forward. We might as well learn by what's already been done. I mean, uh, you know. this, this is hitting real world very quickly. Um, uh, as you, you know, Eric, when you mentioned uh, Axie Infinity, there, there are now thousands of families in the Philippines earning a livable va- wage by paying this playing this game. That's a mind-blowing commentary. Mind-blowing. It's essentially creating a distribution of wealth in a really powerful way. It really is, but it's also creating a new financial system. Think about this. Yeah. Once you have that basis and you and the light bulb goes off and says, why do we have all these inefficient systems? And why is all the money aggregating to these, these central pools and, and being distributed to houses in the Hamptons? Why can't we distribute it out to the people that are actually participating in part of this? And then you say, well, wow, look at the guy, like the guys I met this, uh, this week in New York uh, that started something called Yield Games. Yeah. Uh, you know, what they do is if you're if you don't have the money to go and play something like Axie, they'll loan you some Axies to get going. That's an entire economy right there. Massive opportunity. So how people deal with lending of NFTs and lending of, of tokens and how you deal with yield off of those things and staking mechanisms and decentralized exchanges. All of this did not exist even a few years ago. We're- we're in 1993, 94 of you know, AOL and CompuServe yeah. uh, version of this. World. My, my Sherpa and all this, uh, Michael Janssen, who's, who's been guiding me, I'm basically going, here, take my NFTs and do whatever you want with them. I, <laughs> I totally trust you to navigate this world. There's some bylaw, by the way, that says you have to be below 20 years old to, to write a smart contract. Yeah, um, We have to figure <laughs> that out as well. Yeah. So look, if you, if you want to know some of the cool projects out there, there are pioneers I don't know if they're the Friendsters uh, of the uh, of the world or the MySpaces or the or the Facebooks. That's an analogy uh, uh, to those of you who've been around long enough to see early ideas evolve before they maybe take root and grow. Um, but you can definitely call them smart, uh, successful, and impactful pioneers. The people building art blocks in generative art, the people building Sandbox, which is a truly decentralized uh, community that, that I think is done very well. Uh, the folks at uh, Mutable and Polygon that are building layer two and different types of, uh, of, of blockchains that, um, that lower carbon footprint and lower fees so that you can actually do this stuff at scale. Uh, right. I'm going to inject next question here. Uh, and I'm going to have to ask you guys to pull them out of NIA so we're not, uh, so we engage the community here. Remember, it's about community engagement. <laughs> Next question. From your point of view, what do companies have to do or change within their organizational structure and business models to accelerate the opportunities of the spatial web? Awesome well, question. Yeah, it is a great question. And it's, it's, I have a pretty obvious answer, I think, is, is you, you, they have to be open to experiment, number one. And number two, they have to, be, they have to change their mindset on, on, on how they approach a consumer. The consumer needs to be respected. They need to know that you're aligned with their purpose and values. You can't spray messages at them and hope that that somehow some small percentage of those annoyed won't hate you enough to click on something and 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 go into your 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 business and buy something. You have to look for bringing value and moving to this value-based model, I think is key. Now, one of the aspects of this is you have to start looking at the customer's data as the customer's data. (laughs) When you have customers, the most valuable thing to a company right now as they think about it is that's my customer, that's my data. It's not your data, it's not your customer. The customer owns themselves, the data is owned by them. So what you have to do is you have to share it with them. And increasingly what's gonna happen is you're going to, rather than build these, these isolated campaigns that, that force customers into, a, uh, into your world, you're gonna play in theirs. You're gonna go into the open metaverse, into the open wallets, and you're gonna build your campaigns and your outreach and your value systems and your loyalty programs in those worlds that are shared and open. And you're gonna provide value. And so long as you're providing value, you're gonna get the respect back that you want. And, the, and, and in fact, even more so, you're gonna an exponential return of of consumers that want to organize and participate in your community and make it better, work for your company, become evangelists for your company and participate in building that economy and that community for you. So what I would recommend to these companies is put the toe in the water, but also change your mindset, get your legal people involved to understand the new data sharing rules with the customer themselves and with their wallets and with the emerging metaverses. Amazing. Next question, yeah. 
The fee structure for these things is all over the map. How do you see gas or inherent transaction fees affect on the networks in the future? Great question. Yeah. So there's a lot of talk about how expensive Ethereum is. Well, really? Expensive compared to what? It's expensive. Yeah. If you want to send something worth a dollar, um, you know, if you want to send an NFT, if you want to buy an NFT for a dollar and the gas price is $30 or $300, and that's expensive. If you're buying a $69 million people, then, then it's not. Um, but I think the most important thing to note is that there's a lot of blockchains and a lot of work being done to, uh, to change the model to lower the carbon footprint and lower the fees, the, the, the gas prices. I still think there's a place, a very powerful place for proof of work. I think that those who don't see the enormous progress in using renewable fuels, solar power, wind, um, water power to mine Bitcoins and mine other proof of work uh, coins, they're missing the mark. Uh, it's, it's a lot more uh, damaging to the environment to, for these other forms of, uh, of uh, using electricity to create value. Um, and, and so we're seeing really great progress there. And I think that's going to come. And I think that those blockchains are here. But at the same time, there's a whole other set of things where proof of stake mechanisms and different types of, of chains that, that have different ways of validating transactions are coming. And I don't think that from, from the perspective of the people I'm trying to serve, I don't think it's going to matter. We've built uh, the, the, the VATAM stack from the VATAM uh, um, IP uh, all the way down to the block fee um, uh, underlying open source really took, I think, a smart um, uh, position from the beginning to be blockchain agnostic. Even, even block V's own blockchain is just one of many uh, that it supports. And these things will leapfrog each other long into the future. We're just at the start. And the, and the key is that the consumer just shouldn't care. Mm. Quick question, Eric, on the regulatory. When I've been looking at some of these projects on OpenSea, and they're clearly in violation of SEC type of thinking. They're, you know, uh, but there's so many of them that how do you even get started? Does the SEC get snowed under in all this? Or does it just, does it wash their hands and give up? Or do they try and go after this in some way? Well, they certainly will not give up. And in my, in my view, they should not give up. I'm, I'm in favor of certain types of regulatory uh, clarity. I think it'll, it'll create a massive uh, boost to all of our work and the entire economy we're hoping to see emerge. Uh, right now, the SEC has not been very uh, clear no. about most of this. The only thing that I think they're very clear about is that Bitcoin and Ethereum are not securities. Okay, great. Uh, now, when you look at this other stuff and you start to put the Howey test, which is one of the tests that they put against something to see if it's security, there's a lot of gray area. It would be very helpful for them to say, OK, we've looked at this, this and this project and we've decided it is a security. We looked at this, this and we said it isn't or it wouldn't be if they did these things sufficiently decentralized, doesn't do, you know, have you know, this form of speculation against it or whatever, whatever it is that they want to say uh, mm -hmm. that helps uh, people to understand it. In the meantime, because it's so easy for people to throw things out there, they will do that. Now, the more decentralized the system uh, it is, the less likely, or I guess the less easy it is to find somebody to sue. <laughs> yeah. you know, a, big, a big DAO that nobody owns, that's, that, that, that all the different participants are individually participating in and you know offering something to, but nobody owns it. Uh, what do you do? Go. You, it, traditionally, uh, regulatory bodies don't go after participants in things that they think are are wrong. They go after the people who have you know created and run them. But if no one has created and run them, it becomes problematic. That said, no. I think there's a lot that can be done and, and should be and will. Eric, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in to say. Goodbye to everybody else. You guys keep going strong. Uh, I'm going to go pick up my kids. Uh, yeah. And uh, remember to get new questions here uh, to our Abundance Digital community. Uh, we'll see you on our live stream for the executive program starting on Sunday. Super exciting. Those of you who don't know what Abundance Digital is, you can go and, and Google it and check it out on, on the web. Anyway, uh, I love this conversation and I should have budgeted three hours for it. Uh, <laughs> anyway, time. all right. I'll talk to all you right. guys soon. Yeah. Ask the next question, Nia. Uh, yeah. Bye. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. I'll give a couple more questions, then we'll wrap up. 
Um, similar topic, how does governance work in the metaverse and how do we keep agents behaving for the common objective in a DAO? Okay, very good question. So this is why it's so important to not think of the metaverse as a metaverse. So the, the first part of your question is how does governance work in the metaverse? Well, it works differently depending on which metaverse you're talking about. How will governance work in a centralized metaverse, which is run by an individual or a, a company? It, it, governance will be handled the way it is today, based on the rules that that organization chooses to uh, impose. And that's the end of it. And if you violate those rules, provided it's legal, um, you'll just be kicked out. Um, and that's your consequence. And, uh, you know, it, it, this is very similar to how YouTube works today or, or Instagram or anything. There's rules uh, that are, are handed down from above. Um, if other metaverses, however, are being increasingly built with the idea that the community will set the, the, the terms. And that is the essence of the philosophy of a DAO, that the participants are using their voting power, their, their, the tokens, as represented by their tokens, perhaps, to direct the future and what the community norms might be and the guidelines and the structures. And if, and if you don't like that, uh, you might try to gain influence in that community and alter it. Or you might leave that community and start one of your own or join one that's more suitable to your preference. So I think that's how it's, it, it's going to work and should work. And what's beautiful about it is if we achieve this ideal of interoperable multiverse, where your, your identity and your multiple avatars associated with it and your stuff can move with you from place to place. And those things, they might manifest visually differently as you go from you know, different metaverse rendering engine to another, but if they maintain their structural integrity and their uniqueness, then the economy will work very nicely and people can move from one neo-tribal grouping to another by finding their people, my tribe, the people I want to not only visit with, but maybe uh, join forces with to build something together. So I think that's what's going to happen. Uh, in DAOs today, there's a lot of different models of how they're governed. Uh, but I think the most, um, the, the one that I think is really gaining um, a lot of steam now where people are looking at is, can the original definition of the DAO be um, put forward by the uh, founders of the DAO, because that, that would define it and set it in shape. But then you'd have something called a fair token distribution where you, you might, even the founders may not be taking uh, unusual stakes. You might simply put that, that, that stake uh, forward and say, this is uh, how we're going to distribute these tokens. And then based on your interest in buying in, and then secondly, your interest in participating and doing various things that earn you those tokens, that then gives you different types of voting power, which you may or may not delegate, which is another aspect of how you may want to set up a DAO. You might have to vote if you know per wallet, or you might be able to keep your token, but delegate your vote. And that's what's happening right now. It's amazing to see these structures. And, and then to think back of your you know, high school civics lessons of how uh, various governments were formed on the back of others and different forms of structuring and governing real communities and what we've learned for those and how those are being applied to these next generation virtual communities, I think is vital, especially because, uh, you know, stats show that a vast majority of people are finding that they, they can see a world where a, a lot of their time will be spent on, on, on communities that, that are only exist virtually. And if that's how we're going to spend our time and, and, and that's how we're going to interact with one another, then that's going to, that's going to dictate the flavor of our lives and, and, and how enriching it is and how empowered and purposeful our lives end up being. So we have to uh, enable people to, to live purposefully and have a meaningful stake in, in, in their governments, because that's what these are, the governments of our lives. I'll wrap with one final question. We have successfully proven to be a community who wishes to transact with one another via a utility token for service exchange. What are your recommendations to productize our growth with NFTs? Is it augmenting personas, a published book, or engagement activities to incentivize the community? It would be the latter. I mean, I like the first two. Um, I, would, I would point to the latter and offer one thought. Uh, so the, the last one that you put forward, which is engagement activities that would, um, to, to some degree, increase the value of the community or what the community needs to thrive, 
that's where I would focus my incentive structures and my initial time, because that that's where it will give you some staying power. Once you have a base of operations, you can add all sorts of, of uh, I would say, accoutrements. Um, but the other thing to think about is um, bad actors and good actors. Just because you have a lot of well-meaning people setting something up by no means uh, it means that, that, that you're going to end up with well-meaning people <laughs> as your community grows. Uh, people tend to uh, do things that might be uh, abhorrent to a community. And what you need to do is find ways to enhance uh, the, the, the behaviors that you want to promote and also uh, dissuade people from doing the others. Now, there's a lot of schemes around this that are related to reputation scores and things like this, and, and they have, they're problematic. So what I ask you to think about is, if you are too transparent about do this and you get that, guess what happens? It's just like a, a rat with cheese or whatever, you, you're a rat that gets sugar water if, you, if, you, if they hit a pedal. As soon as they realize it, they keep hitting the pedal over and over. So people will game the system once they understand the rules of the game too well. So what you need is some things are for play and some things are for fun, but some things that actually govern reputation and auras and how you, uh, how, how, how you uh, reward behaviors you might want a more of an opaque algorithm uh, similar to how Google, no one really knows exactly, maybe the belly of the beast they do, but exactly how Google, you know, things rise and fall. There's all these companies trying to game the system. Uh, similarly in these communities, really think about how you start rewarding people with surprise and delight and interesting things where they start to get a sense like, I generally know if I'm behaving well <laughs> and according to these norms, good things are gonna happen to me. And I generally know if I'm not, then, then I'm going to be ushered out and I'm not gonna get those rewards all the way to the point of being asked to leave. But if, you, if you're too obvious with it, then the, the, the idea of the community gives way to the idea of the reward. Absolutely right. Um, um, Eric, on behalf of Peter, I'll just take over and say thank you. Uh, unbelievable wisdom dropping. Uh, this is one of those where people want to go and watch it again and again just to have it uh, seep in by osmosis. Uh, thank you so much for your time. And it's great thank to be connected to you again. Uh, yeah, Salim, so good to be invited. Thank you. Good to see you again. Likewise.